Okay, let's thank you so much. We'll just took a pause to divide the study into two sections, those who are doing this online. So like I, I just said here, we're dealing with the discrepancies and we are still laboring on number one, what's the way Judah die? And I said to you that both statements are true. He hanged himself and also his guts, guts gushed out and so on and so forth. For the first night of Passover, they ate the family meal because I said to the, 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 the people here that the first night of something comes before the first day. So carry on making your notes. The first night of Passover, they eat the family meal. What Jesus Christ did with the apostle in the upper room. Now the first day of Passover, at 9 a.m. in the morning, the first day of Passover, at 9 a.m. in the morning, you have a morning sacrifice, a special one only for the priesthood. You have the morning sacrifice, a special one only for the priesthood. And this special sacrifice is called the Agega. <coughs> Agiga. This is not for the people, not for the common people, it's for the priesthood. But, if you have a dead body within the walls of the city, the city would be unclean. If you have a dead body within the walls of the city, hanging on a tree or any dead body, it would render the city unclean. If the body is within the walls of the city, the priesthood cannot partake into the agega. But if you take the oh, body of the person... I lost the middle section. I got uh, in, in the city rendered unclean. If the body is within the walls... The city is unclean. Okay. All right. But if you have a dead body, render it unclean. But if you take the body from here, the first wall here, and that's the city and so on, you have what you call the Valley of Enon. And if you take the dead body and you throw it into the Valley of Enon, which has a sheer drop here, yeah. you render the city clean. And that's what happened here with Judas Iscariot. He hang himself, loosening the bowels and so on. So the servants of the priest, they took his body and they throw his body over the wall, falling down into the valley of Enom, gate Enom, and his bowels gushed out in verse 18. So this way, both statements are true. Makes sense. And you know, when you go to Israel, you can see the valley of Enom. It's a sheer drop. You lift up the body, and he falls down. And having hang himself, I don't need to be graphic. I don't want to be graphic to you. It's not the hanging, like breaking the neck at that time. It's hanging, and you do whatever you do, loosening the organs and so on. Take that body, and he gushed out. So once understood this way, both statements are true. Not only because of this, but also because the anatomy. Yes. Germain. Okay. Uh, when uh, dead bodies within the walls, the priest can't do what? Sacrifice. Partake of the agega, partake of the sacrifice because the city is unclean. They would not touch the body themselves, but they would ask other people to get rid of the dead body within the walls. So, first discrepancy, there is no discrepancy. Did he hang himself? Absolutely. Did his balls gushed out? Absolutely. Both statements are true when understood this way. Mm -hmm. Number two, point number two, discrepancy number two, who purchased the field? Because that's in the, the text, I will point out who purchased the field. I will direct you to the scriptures. It's another point of Jewish law. And once again, both statements are true. Make your notes before I show you from the text. Mm -hmm. 
by Jewish law, money wrongfully, money deceitfully gained, could not be put in the temple treasury. Money wrongfully gained cannot be put in the temple treasury. This is money for God. So you don't put stolen money or bribe money in there. Go to Matthew verses 6 and 7. And the chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful. Circle not lawful. It means not permitted to put them in the treasury since it is the pride of blood. That's the money bribed to Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. And they, circle they, took counsel and bought with them the, the 30 pieces of silver, the potter's field, to bury strangers in it. Circled the word they, this is the priesthood, and brought with them the potter's field, and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in it. Okay? Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day, and so on. You can stop until this day. Go to Acts 18. Turn your page, because you don't remember already that I asked you to circle this man. Look at Luke, what he says. Now this man, which is Judas Iscariot, obtained a field with the reward of his iniquity. Okay? Who bought the field? The chief priests or Judah himself? Once again, both statements are true. The priesthood knew about it, about not putting the money in the treasury. Usually, it has to go back to the donor. So that money should have been given back to the donor. The money should have been given back to Judas, Judas Iscariot, normally. But if the donor dies before the money is returned, if the donor dies before the money is returned, they still cannot put the money in the temple treasury. They still cannot put the money in the temple treasury. And this is the case with Judas Iscariot here. Now what they can do, and that's what they did, they have to use the money for the public good, for something that benefits the public, the common good. So they buy a field to bury strangers in it. But they buy a field to bury strangers in it. But by Jewish law, it had to be bought in the name of the donor. Uh -huh. But by Jewish law, it has to be bought in the name of the donor. So your paperwork, the legal documents, would have the name of Judas in it. So that's why Luke says, this man bought a field. Matthew gives us the events as they did happen. Matthew gives us the events as it did happen. Luke, the doctor, gave us the legal aspect of it. There is no discrepancy. Okay? Luke writes, being a doctor, more literate, document-oriented, gives us the legal aspect of it. Matthew, the fisherman, wrote his account. That's how it did happen. So who bought the field? The priest and Judas Iscariot. It's easily reconcilable within the Jewish frame of reference. That is the two discrepancies between Matthew and Luke, or Matthew and Acts. Okay? The way Judas died, now solved. 
and what the field solve. So again, perhaps the most important point of the evening is to trust your Bible. There is no such a thing as discrepancies in it when you understand what, what, how it goes. We take the last one. Okay? Number three. Number three, what? Number three, discrepancy. Come with me in Matthew. This one is only in Matthew. Wherefore, start in verse 8 and 9 and 10. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Circle Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was priced, whom certain of the children of Israel did price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Here, the discrepancy, you have the quotation of Jeremiah, but the verse is found in Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 13. Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 13. I'm going to read it for you. Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 13. You will recognize the verse right away. The Lord said unto me, Throw it into the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 pieces of shekels and silver, threw them into the potter's house. So what's wrong with it? How come Matthew says, saying by the prophet Jeremiah, and you found the quote in Zechariah 11, 13? I need your full concentration. Three suggestions to it. The first two are not my favorite. The last one will be kept for dessert. Three suggestions for this. From the Jewish frame again, sometimes a prophetic scroll is named after the one prophet. That's exactly when, what happened with the last part here, Habutin here. You, the first book is the psalm, and sometimes you can use the word psalm for the entire part, which is the third part of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? You say, oh, it says in the psalm, but you call it psalm, but it can be found in Hezra. So, so sometimes the first part of a prophetic scroll is named after only after the first prophet. This is true of the Hebrew Bible about the psalm. We say, it's written about me in the law, the prophet, and the psalm. He met the third, the third part also in full. Okay? We, so if he speaks about the former prophet here, this is the first solution. If he speaks about the former or the, la, the, 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 the former prophets or the former uh, and latter and major and minor it's Joshua who is the first one so if he wants to quote that he would have used Joshua not Jeremiah and if he wants to go with the latter prophet the la the first latter prophet it's not Jeremiah it's Isaiah okay do you understand this you name the section after the first one it's not Isaiah it's Je it's not Jeremiah it's Isaiah so the first doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. That's the first suggestion. That he made a mistake here. He would have liked to say Isaiah, but he went with Jeremiah. Are you with me? Okay? That's not the possibility. Second possibility. Simply put that it was a scribal error. This is not so good either. We have in the Bible some scribal errors. Jehoash, Joash, because they put a stroke of a letter with their pen ink on thick parchment and it's too fat and you don't know, they don't know, is that Jehoash or Joash and so on, and a scribal error. This is to be dismissed as well. The third one is the best option, but the third one necessitates work. That's the best option. So two possibilities that uh, some come up with an explanation like this? That's it, that some we dismiss, that we dismiss, that the book is ah. named after the first section. Okay. We dismiss that. Yeah, 
Okay? Because a, a scholar or a serious student, you read this and you don't check the reference. Let's be honest, but here, since the beginning, it's been claimed to be an in-depth study. So if you face a question like this, which you probably will never face that, because the people don't know these things. Yeah. But a class with TSM, we need to decipher that. For what reason? To take pride? Not at all. Just to be grounded that there is no mistake, at least major mistakes. Yes, we have discrepancies on numbers this place sometimes, because there was 30 scribes in a classroom when they come up with the copies of the scriptures and so on. 30 scribes writing in Hebrew and so on, when people were holding a scroll and so on. So if you're tired a little bit, and at that time the fluorescent like this were rather rare, candle lights type of thing, and you're a bit like this, and you, uh, and you make a stroke with the pen, you know what I'm talking it's about. Oh, hey, oh, hey. Now you change the meaning of the word, yeah. but they are minor. Right. So, the first one, if it's the former prophet, it would, it would have said Joshua. If it's the latter prophet, he would have said Isaiah. Now, why it's written Jeremiah, we dismiss the first, the second one, that we also dismiss a scribal error. It's too big of an error to be a scribal one. Yeah. I am giving you, and you need the concentration, the third option. I have a question for you. Who is recording this right now? Matthew. Matthew. Matthew is the one concerned with the rejection of the Messianic Kingdom, the unforgivable sin, and the consequences of it, which is AD 70. He is the one concerned with this. That's why you have all the parables of the Kingdom found in Matthew and so on. He is the one that expounds the most on the Kingdom of God program. And the blasphemy against Beelzebub and so on. Remember one thing that I said in the past. Matthew backs up Jeremiah because Jeremiah wrote in light of an impending judgment. Matthew wrote in, line of a ju in light of a judgment also, the judgment of the unforgivable sin. So there is a reason for Matthew here for quoting Zechariah and making reference to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Come with me in the book of Jeremiah. If you have your Bible with you, come with me in Jeremiah chapter 7. Come with me in Jeremiah chapter 7 for a moment. 31 to 34. Come with me in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 31 to 34. Listen closely. The prophecy will be here in the valley of Enon. And somewhere in this valley, there was a little place, tiny place, very close to the city, very close to the temple, the very valley where Judas Iscariot was, was thrown. There was a place called Topheth. Topheth. It means the fireplace. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 31 to 34. They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the sons of Enum, to burn their son sons and the daughters in fire, which I did not command, and it did not come to my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares Jehovah, when it will no longer be called Topheth, or the valley of the sons of Enum, but the valley of the slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth, because there is no other place. Verse 33. The dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds for the sky, and for the beasts of the earth and no one will frighten them away. Verse 34. Then I will make to cease from the city of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy, of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land will become a ruin. These were prophecies under severe kings, such as Manasseh, 
These were prophecies given under severe kings by Jeremiah. Good example of that is Menasseh because they were offering their sons and daughters as human sacrifice. And these human sacrifice were given somewhere in the Valley of Enom. In Jeremiah, it's important right now, we have a curse. In Hebrew, the Valley of Enom is called Gay. Enom. That's the name in Hebrew, Gay Enom. That's where we have the Greek word Gehenna from. The Gehenna, the place of burning. We have it from there. Gay Enom, Gehenna. Gehenna is the Greek form of it. Let's call it the Hellenized form of it. Gehenna is the equivalent of the lake of fire. That's why here Topheth means the fireplace. Gehenna is the equivalent of the lake of fire, and that's the origin, the origin of that name. Come with me, Jeremiah 19. Come with me, Jeremiah 19. Verses 1 to 15, but I'm just going to start in verse 10 just for the sake of time. Jeremiah chapter 19, verses 1 to 15. Let me start in verse 10. Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany you, speaking to Jeremiah, and say to them, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Just so will I break this people and this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel which cannot again be repaired. And they will bury in Topheth, once again, because there is no other place for burial. This is how I will treat this place and its inhabitants, Jerusalem, declares Jehovah, so as to make this city like Topheth. So, verse 13, This house of Jerusalem and the house of the kings of Judah will be defiled like the place of Topheth, because all the house on whose roof stop they burn sacrifices to hold the heavenly host and pour out drink offering to other gods. Verse 14 is very important. Then Jeremiah came to Topheth. Right there in the valley of Enom, he was there sometime. Then Jeremiah came to Topheth, where the Lord had set him to prophesy, and he stood in the courts of the Lord's house and said to all the people, and so on, we can turn down. We can stop right there, right there. So, make your notes now. One day in Topheth, which was located in the valley of Enon, they will bury there until there is no more place to bury. They will bury deads in that place until there is no more place to bury. My next sentence is very important. What Matthew points out is here. At the purchase of this very area in the Valley of Enon, when they purchased the little field, the field of blood in the Valley of Enon, at the same time when they purchased the field, they purchased the Jeremiah curse upon them. And that's exactly what happened in AD 70. The judgment will come. 1,100,000 Jews were buried there until there was no more room to bury. So when they buy that field here, they buried at the same time, they bought at the same time the Jeremiah curse. Meaning they fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy? It will be fulfilled by AD 70. They bought the curse. But they begin to fulfill it. That's it. Yeah. Acts 19 says it. 
the field of blood, al kadama it's Aramaic, that is the field of blood. It's called blood with the price of blood. And it became literally true because of the death of Christ and so on. 40 years later, after AD 30, the place of buried was full, it was fully buried in there. So, make a note, Matthew mentions Jeremiah, Matthew does men mention Jeremiah to point out the Jeremiah curse. That came as a result of the unforgivable sin, I repeat. Matthew mentions Jeremiah to point out the Jeremiah curse that ultimately came as a result of the unforgivable sin. Why did he quote Zechariah? To give us the actual price of the field. He quotes Zechariah to give us the actual price, but he writes Jeremiah, guys, you have bought the curse on yourself. I'm done with this. does for me because Matthew with his theme and so on Matthew's theme is Jesus the Messiah the King of the Jews and he is the one recording all these things and he is the one that writes in an impending judgment so that's why he knows about that judgment because of Jeremiah and he only mentions and only mentions Zechariah to give the price of the, the 30 pieces of silver that we have subtle if you want to but that's exactly that's the best explanation to basically reconcile that discrepancy paragraph 159 the civil trial but you know what i think we'll call it an evening based upon that and so on really? yeah that's it i think uh let me Look at your outlines. Okay, the civil trial, paragraph 159 to paragraph 152. Look at your outlines right now. What? 169, 159 to 162. You have the first trial before Pilate, stage one, the trial before Herod Antipas, stage two, and the second trial before Pilate again, Pontius Pilate, stage three. It's going to be finished by a mockery here. All right, let me say just a few sentences for another five minutes, okay? Just the, before I get into the, and this will be behind us. The civil trial will come in three specific stages also, between 159 and 162. The issue of the religious trial was blasphemy. And blasphemy here has nothing to do with the issue of the civil trial. Why? Because blasphemy is not punishable by death under the Roman law. The issue here under the civil trial will be sedition as sedition is uh, when you do a revolt, uh, okay. sedition or treason, treason. How do you say that, Fred? Treason. treason. Treason, thank you so much. Yeah. T-R-E, treason. Oh, is that easy? Okay. That's the issue here. That's the issue, you may not blasphemy. It's you, sedition is rebelling against Rome, and treason is, treason is, I'm the king. I'm willing to replace Caesar and so on. That's basically what Jews, Sanhedrin, tried to sell to the Roman law in order to put the Messiah to death. That's it, exactly, yes. All these complicated and not being organized and so on. Because he released the cohort. Judas Iscariot released the cohort, and if you release a cohort, it's like calling 50 cars of the RCMP. 
the cohort is Roman, they're not concerned about what you say in your church. It's not their business. It has to be a crime accusable from Roman law, and now he's gone. Judas is scared that's supposed to step in in a moment will be gone. Okay, that's the issue here. Simply a few more notes. Pilate, called Pontius Pilate, was a Roman citizen, a Roman citizen born in Spain. He was born in Spain. Pontius Pilate was a procurator from 26 to 36 AD. We are 38 AD right now, so from 26 to 36 AD. 26, 36. 26, 36. In Jewish writings outside the Bible, he is very well known to be cruel. And he was a very, very strict follower of Roman procedures. Now you will see in a moment, or rather not next week, but in two weeks, Pilate being dressed and ready to conduct a trial. He is ready to conduct a trial in the wee hours of the morning, in the very early hours of the morning. The thing to remember for you is the fact that he is the one that provided the cohort to Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. There are two Roman laws, two Roman laws that will affect this trial. You have two Roman laws that will largely affect this trial. The civil trial. Number one, all proceedings have to be public. Mm -hmm. Very much to Pilate's later regret. All proceedings, still in number one, have to be public. Not public, but public, but public. Mm -hmm. Number two, the trial had to start with the prosecuting witness. The trial had to start with the prosecuting witness bringing the charge. Needless to tell you that the charge has to be punishable by Roman laws. The prosecuting witness bringing the charge. And of course, a charge or the charge has to be punishable under Roman law. Make your note right now. It is right here that Judas was needed. So basically, they lost their prosecuting witness because he committed suicide. The Jews lost their prosecuting witness against Jesus, which would have been Judas Iscariot. The reason is because he committed suicide. So what I want you to write emphatically, and this is my last statement, this is right there that Judah is needed in the civil trial. And then in two weeks when I see you again, we carry on. I'm not going to have to repeat and we'll get into everything that is basically happening in this statement. The most fascinating part of your study will prove to be the procession to Calvary. And you can write beside the procession to Calvary right now. You will, you will study that in 32 different stages. 32 different stages. So between D and G, the ceiling of the tombs, you will find 32 different stages. Very, very, very detailed. Fred, I always put you on the spot and I will do it again tonight. Fred, would you finish that for us, please? Father, we just thank you for this time that we have, Father, to send you word. We thank you, Father, for the time you've given us here. We thank you for everyone in this room. We pray, Father, that as we go our own ways this week, that you keep us mindful of, of your son Jesus. Keep us mindful of, of what he wants, Father, and what he wants of us. Father, we just pray for our brothers and sisters that aren't with us tonight, Father. We pray for, for 
safety for them and pray for them that they are continuing to dig into into your word, Father. Father, we just uh, we just love and thank you so much. We thank you for your grace, and we just uh, we love this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Two, four, six. Beautiful. God bless you. Get tired, beloved. Good night. Did you shower?